Okay, so let's continue where we stopped last time. We were discussing the linearized field equation. Linearized field equation means we write the metric in the form eta mu nu Minkowski metric plus h mu nu. And we linearize all expressions with respect to h mu nu and its derivatives. Yeah? In particular, in, with respect to the first derivative, the field equation is linear in the second derivative or anyway. But if it were not linear in the second derivative, we would also linearize with respect to the second derivative. OK, and we use the notation that uh, we wrote h without an index for the trace, which is formed with the eta mu nu. And our convention is we raise and lower in this chapter indices with the eta. And then I plugged this into the field equation, and I calculated the field equation up to first order in h. And as usual, I produced a mess with the signs. So I checked it again. Uh, I hope what I write down now is correct. So what I've written down last time was not correct. There were several sign mistakes. Uh, so I hope the correct uh, linearized field equation is uh, h minus d u d rho h mu nu minus d sigma d nu h sigma mu. I think all the terms were correct. So the, the expressions were correct, but the signs were uh, completely, <laughs> uh, completely messed up. Uh, plus box operator. That's a wave operator formed with a Minkowski metric. h mu nu minus eta mu nu box h minus partial sigma partial tau h sigma tau. And on the right hand side, we have now two times kappa t mu nu. So you see it's linear, of course, because we linearized. This is now a linear differential equation for the perturbation h. And that's what we want to solve. Well, looks pretty ugly. Six terms on the left-hand side. Fortunately, we can simplify this expression considerably. We have two freedoms, and we will make use of both of them. First, we can introduce a new variable instead of the h. We can substitute something else for the h. This will simplify the terms already a little bit. And then we are also free to make coordinate transformations, which preserve this form. And if we do both things, then the equation will be considerably simplified. So the first, uh, the first simplification we, we make is that we introduce something which we call gamma instead of the h menu. And h menu is the h menu minus, yes, minus the trace of h half times eta mu nu. So linearizing with respect to h is the same as linearizing with respect to gamma, yeah, because the relation between the two things is linear. And we will see that if we, in, if we uh, rewrite this in terms of the gamma, then it becomes um, already a little bit simpler. So uh, in order to solve this for h mu nu, I must express the, uh, uh, the trace of uh, h mu nu by the trace of gamma mu nu. So if I take the trace, so if I write gamma without indices, I mean this thing. OK, if I calculate the right-hand side, uh, transvected with eta mu nu, I get an h here. Yeah, I get minus h half. And the trace of the eta is 4, right? The trace of the unit matrix in four dimensions, this is 4. And uh, here I have plus 1, minus 2, this is minus h. So the trace of gamma is minus the trace of h. And this means when we solve this expression for h, then we have gamma mu nu on the other side. And then I have plus h half, but this is minus gamma half. Minus gamma half eta mu nu. And we can now plug these expressions into the field equation and see what we get. And well. The idea is that you want to kill the traces. Here are the terms where you have the trace. Uh, so you make an ansatz. Einstein did this uh, actually in 1916, where you write here a certain factor times h. 
and then you determine the factor in such a way that the traces cancel from this equation. This was the idea, right? And the factor is minus one half. So uh, let's plug this expression into the field equation. So then I have minus partial nu, partial nu gamma. This is this here. H is minus gamma. Then here minus d mu d rho gamma mu. Oh, there's something wrong with the indices. Let me see. Uh, obviously, this is supposed to be a rho. Gamma rho mu. Uh, yet now minus gamma half. Minus times minus gives plus. It's one half eta mu nu d mu d rho gamma. So this was this term. Yeah, these two, uh, the last two terms are, are this here, then this here, minus d sigma d nu gamma sigma mu plus one half eta sigma mu d sigma d nu gamma. This is this here. Then the box operator applied to H is minus eta mu nu uh, one half box applied to gamma minus eta mu nu. Okay, uh, H was minus gamma, uh, minus, and here I have minus d sigma d tau gamma sigma tau plus one half eta sigma tau d sigma d tau gamma and on the other side I have two kappa t mu nu and now comes the interesting question if I have all the factors right, then some terms should cancel. Actually, all the trace terms should cancel. Here I have a trace. Uh, here, I have it, here I have it with minus one. Here I have it with plus one half. Uh, and here there's something wrong with the indices. What did I do here? Eta mu nu, that's correct, this must be a row. Okay. Uh, let me see. The mu, that's the same, right? The so sigma is pulled down, so it comes with minus one plus one half. I should have this again. Uh, why do I have this? Oh, something is again wrong. <laughs> Let me check. This one half. The menu. Plus one half, that's correct. It's gonna minus one half. Plus one half. Was this correct? Let me check. Was well, this term right? Eta rho, uh, uh, eta rho nu. And then you see rho nu are the indices on the H. They uh, become the indices on the eta, and then I have mu rho, mu rho, and this looks much better because then it's again the same term, minus one plus one half plus one half, and now they cancel. Okay, and let's see what about this term here. Eta mu nu times uh, uh, d'Alembert operator applied to gamma, I get with a plus one, minus one half minus one half. So these three terms also cancel. And this is already considerably better. We had six terms in the beginning. Now we have one, two, three, four terms. So we already made some progress. And now you see that all the terms 
involve a divergence of gamma. Here is summation over rho. Here is summation <coughs> over sigma. It's again a divergence. Summation over sigma, a divergence. And uh, if we were able to kill all these divergent terms, then only this term would survive and you would get a very nice wave equation. And that's actually possible to kill the divergence terms if we make a coordinate transformation. So we are still, we may still make coordinate transformations. Well, which preserve this form of the metric. Yeah, not arbitrary coordinate transformations, but coordinate transformations which preserve this form of the metric and which uh, also take care of the fact that this uh, is supposed to be so small that we can linearize with respect to this. So the transformation we are allowed to, uh, to do must preserve the eta, so it must be Poincaré transformations, plus a small perturbation, a perturbation which is small of first order so that we can linearize. And such a transformation is of the form if uh, our original coordinates are x mu, x0, x1, x2, x3, then we may introduce new ones, which are just uh, um, uh, produced from the old one by a translation, constant a mu, plus a Lorentz transformation, uh, x nu, where lambda is a, is a Lorentz transformation, and then something which is small, so that we can linearize with respect to this. This may depend on x, of course. Mm -hmm on the coordinates. That's the type of coordinates we are still free to make. And, uh, well, uh, these two things do not help much, <laughs> but this, this is relevant because this allows us to, yeah, to kill some of the terms which are smaller first order, like these terms here. And that's what we will do now. So, uh, for this, for this uh, purpose, uh, it doesn't help if we choose an a mu different from zero or lambda mu nu different from unity. So we just um, uh, look at uh, a transformation x mu goes to x mu tilde, which is x mu plus F mu for an x, I, I should write here uh, where F mu is smaller first order. By that I mean it's allowed to linearize with respect to F mu and its first derivative. So what we need to know is how under such a transformation um, yeah, the quantities which we have in the equations uh, behave, so in particular the gamma. Well, I have to begin with a g. g mu, ah, no, I have to begin with, uh, uh, have, uh, before that I have to calculate uh, how the differential transform, uh, transformed. So obviously dx mu goes in to dx mu plus d rho f mu dx rho, right? It's just a chain rule for the second term. And uh, then the, the dual basis, so these are the basis elements for the covectors, the dual basis elements, d u, my claim is that they transform in this way with a minus sign. Uh, d, uh, how is this now? Uh, I have here a d rho, and then I must here have f nu rho, must be this way. Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, I think so. Let's see if this is true. So this must be the dual basis to this basis. Yeah? So if I apply this covector field to this vector field, I must get a conical. Then I made everything correct. So, and if I get something else, then I made a mistake. So let's check. So I have to prove that, of course, this gives a chronica before the transformation. I have to check that it's also true after the transformation of mu dx rho. That's a covector field. So it has one slot. I can put vector fields into this slot, and that's what I do here. And let's see what we get. So this gives the Kronecker delta mu nu. 
this gives a chronic mu rho minus, so, uh, okay, let me, let me write it uh, uh, slowly, rho delta rho mu, this is this, then if I apply this to this, then I get a chronic rho nu, plus, uh, there's a sign mistake, uh, wait a minute, uh, no, no, I think it's true, sorry, uh, it's true. D rho f mu rho nu chronica. And then I get a term which is of second order, yeah, because here I have something proportional to a derivative of f, and here also. So these two things multiplied give something of second order. Uh, let's see. So here the rho is pulled down, gives a mu minus d nu f mu, and here the rho is pulled down, gives some, oh, there's something wrong with the indices. You uh, must be up. What did I, yeah, yeah, it is up, it is up, yeah? Yeah, so I, I pull, uh, so I replace the rho by the mu. Yeah, the chronicle just uh, means uh, insert, uh, insert the mu for the row. And then here I get uh, the same thing with the other sign. So it is indeed delta mu nu. That's what I wanted to get. Okay, so we know how the basis uh, covectors and the basis vectors transform. And then I can, transfer, uh, can calculate what happens with our g mu nu. What is g mu nu? g mu nu is a metric applied to D mu D nu, right? And uh, this, of course, this is an invariant object. It has nothing to do with coordinates. It's a tensor field on the manifold. And this here is a representation of the tensor field in our chosen coordinates. So I have to insert the basis vectors of our coordinates. And I know how this transforms. This doesn't transform. It remains what it is. And this transforms as I have calculated here d mu minus d mu f rho d rho d nu minus d nu f sigma d sigma. Okay, so these two things together give g mu nu. These two things together give g rho sigma rho sigma d mu uh, oh, let me begin with this term here. Uh, rho nu. D mu f rho. These two terms give minus g mu sigma d mu f sigma. Which is uh, G mu nu, so um, G mu nu is eta plus h. So if the h hits the derivative of f, I get something of second order, so I only need the first term here. Yeah, so only the first term uh, is taken into account. The second one gives second order, we don't take it into account. So I have to multiply this with eta rho nu, and our convention was we pull indices with the eta. So I'm allowed to write just minus d mu f nu, yeah, plus the second order terms. And the same way here, so the sigma becomes a mu minus d nu f sigma. Okay, so that's the transformation behavior of the g mu nu in this order. Well, we are actually interested in the h mu nu, which is g mu nu minus eta mu nu. So this goes into this minus eta. Eta remains eta. Yeah, there's no, there's no change. This kind of transformation doesn't change the eta. Or rather, it changes the eta only in second order. Uh, okay. Um, g mu nu uh, minus eta. And then these two terms, minus d mu f nu, minus uh, what this of course is supposed to be a mu here, f mu. 
And this here is again h. So this is h mu nu minus d mu f mu minus d mu f mu. So that's the transformation behavior of the h. And what we are actually interested in is the gamma, which was h mu nu minus h half eta mu nu. So the h transforms into this here h mu nu minus d mu f nu minus d mu f mu. And the h, that's a trace of this thing. So I have minus 1 half eta mu nu, the trace of this thing. So this is h minus, uh, let me just write it this way. And this comes again two times, OK? And now you see this here, h mu nu minus 1 half eta h. This is gamma mu nu. So this is gamma mu nu minus d mu f nu minus d mu f mu. And here, minus 1 half minus 2 gives plus 1. Plus, I shouldn't call the summation index mu because mu is already used, right? So I'm allowed to use any index, but not mu and not nu. So let's write rho. Uh, eta mu nu f, uh, partial derivative f rho. So this is the transformation behavior of the gamma. That's what we need. And now let's see. Our goal was to kill all these divergence terms. Here's a divergence of this thing. So let's see what happens to the divergence under such a transformation. So let's see what happens to uh, this expression. So this goes into what? So I have to apply the partial derivative with respect to x mu with an upper index to this expression. So this goes into gamma mu uh, gamma gamma. Then I have partial mu, partial mu. This gives a box, a d'Alembert operator, minus d'Alembert operator f nu. Here I have minus d nu d mu f mu. I can interchange partial derivatives. That's what I've done here. And here I have I have a partial derivative with upper index mu. This gives a partial derivative with lower index nu. Minus d nu u rho f rho. Uh, it should be a plus. It is a plus, very <laughs> good. <laughs> because then these two terms cancel. Yeah, it's the same expression. Just the summation index has a different name here. And uh, so that's what, what comes out of this transformation. And the question is, can I make this equal to zero? Yeah? This was our goal. We wanted to transform this to zero. Is this possible? So yes, it is possible. What we have to do is we have to choose our f nu. Uh, right. If this is equal to this here. The question is, can one solve this equation? So this is what we started with. Yeah, we have written all the expressions in a certain coordinate system. In this coordinate system, our perturbation is described by this gamma mu nu, and then we can calculate this expression. So this is given, so to speak. Yeah? We, have, uh, uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, manipulate this in any way. And now we make a coordinate transformation which involves a function f nu, which we are allowed to choose as we like. Yeah? And the question is, can we choose the f nu such that this equation holds? And its suggestion, is it possible to solve this equation? Wave equation, yeah? We are, we are on a special relativistic space-time. It has nothing to do with general relativity. It has something to do, but uh, uh, not, in a, uh, not, not this equation. I looked at it from a purely mathematical point of view. This is special relativity. Wave operator on flat space-time applied to f nu is supposed to be something given. This is a very well-known equation. Everybody has seen this equation in electrodynamics, for instance. Then what is called f nu here is usually called a nu. It's the electromagnetic potential. And this is the given current. 
a given four current yeah, with an index nu. And well, if this is nicely behaved, if it is spatially uh, compactly supported, then the physically most interesting solution is the retarded potential. Yeah? So if this is compactly supported in space, then we can even write down explicitly a solution. But if this is not compactly supported, then the retarded potentials do not exist, but nonetheless this equation admits solutions. And you can see this in the following way, write down an initial value problem. Yeah? So this is given everywhere in the entire space-time. Now prescribe initial values for this function on a surface t equal constant, x0 equal constant. And this is a hyperbolic operator, so it has a unique solution to, and uh, not unique, it has, uh, well, if, if the initial conditions are, are fixed, then it has a unique solution to, uh, to given initial conditions on, on the surface t equal constant. So we can construct, we can even choose initial conditions for this function f nu and for its first derivatives on a surface t equal constant. And then we can solve this. And so there is a solution. So a solution exists. Exists for any d mu, gamma mu nu, whatever we have on the right hand side. Uh, well, um, certain. Uh, it shouldn't be too crazy in, in terms of uh, non-differentiability or things like that, but uh, if it is uh, something with, um, which is not too badly, uh, not too pathological, then, um, uh, then it always exists. And then we can transform this expression to zero, right? If you make such a transformation and this becomes zero, and then the field equation becomes very simple, the linearized field equation, Well, all these terms where we have this diverge, well, if the divergence is zero, then identically zero. Uh, then, of course, the derivative is also zero. Yeah? So all these terms are gone. This is gone, and this is gone. So the only term which survives is this here. So the field equation is just this here. And we have to keep in mind that we have this, uh, uh, this, this condition, that this is transformed to zero. You gamma mu nu is zero. So this condition is called the Hilbert gauge condition. It, you see, it uh, has a certain analogy to uh, the gauge conditions we know from electrodynamics. There you have uh, your dynamical variable is the potential, the electromagnetic potential in electrodynamics. It has only one index. And if the divergence is zero, then we call this the Lorentz gauge in electrodynamics. So this is analogous to the Lorentz gauge, and it is called the Hilbert gauge. I think that's the proper name, because Hilbert was a person who actually demonstrated that it is possible to choose this gauge. Einstein had used it in his 1916 paper, but he had not proven that it is possible. So it's sometimes called the Einstein gauge, and later it was used by, by the Donder and by Fock. So some people also call it the Donder gauge or the Fock gauge. But I think Hilbert gauge is a historically uh, most justified name. So this is a field equation, a linearized field equation. So it's a wave equation, an ordinary wave equation with a source. And uh, the solution is uh, subject to a, certain, uh, to a certain gauge condition. And you see the formalism is now very similar to electrodynamics. Oh, I think this is not enough space. So. I hope you see the analogy. So if we have here the linearized Einstein equation or Einstein theory, and here we have electromagnetism, the Maxwell theory. And here our dynamical variable is the gamma mu nu. Yeah, we now view this as a basic uh, variable. Of course, it's in a one-to-one -one relation to this h mu nu. So in essence, it is a deviation of the g mu nu from the eta. The dynamical variable in electromagnetism is usually the vector potential. That's what we usually uh, use as a, as a dynamical variable. Uh, the, the 
condition, oh, I say, first I write the source. Yeah? Uh, here on the right hand side I have a source, which is T mu nu. What is the source for the A mu? This is the current, J mu. Yeah? So the energy momentum tensor corresponds to the four current, the electro, uh, the, the, charge, uh, the charge current. Uh, and uh, then we have this condition here, the Hilbert gauge. And here we have the Lorentz gauge, d mu a mu equals zero. And the field equation is box gamma mu nu is two kappa t mu nu. And here we have box a mu nu, a mu, only one index. And uh, yeah, instead of the gravitational constant, we now have some other dimensional constant, which gives a coupling to the uh, to the current, and in SI units you have here the, uh, uh, the permeability of vacuum inverse, JMU. Uh, there are funny conventions uh, as far as the units are concerned uh, in electromagnetism, so that's what we have to use now. Oops. So this is the analogy. So we end up with a theory which uh, tells us that gravity is quite similar to electromagnetism. But this is true only in the linearized formalism. Yeah? We have made this uh, assumption that, um, yeah, that, we, that we kill all the nonlinearities, and then the theory is very similar to, uh, to electromagnetism. If you take the nonlinearities into account, the theory is completely different, and this should be kept in mind. In particular, people have used this setting as a starting point for quantizing gravity. So since, uh, say, early 1930s or so, we have an idea how to quantize electromagnetism. This gives quantum electrodynamics, and it's based on precisely this formalism. And uh, now, with this analogy, now we could do something, something similar here. And uh, well, this works to a certain extent. There are some differences. Of course, one difference is that here I have two indices, here I have only one index. This leads to the, to, the, to the fact that while a photon, the quantum of uh, quantum electrodynamics, has been spin one, the graviton, which is the quantized version of the gamma mu nu, has been two. Yeah, that's the first difference. And the second difference is that here we have a, dimension, a dimensionful coupling constant in the game, where in electromagnetism we can, uh, yeah, we can boil everything down to the fine structure fine structure constant, which is dimensionless. And this is, this is another major problem. If you have a coupling constant with a dimension, then the, quant, uh, yeah, the, the quantizing formalism um, yeah, becomes, becomes kind of pathological. But uh, apart from these two differences, the formalism now is, uh, is quite analogous to electromagnetism. And uh, yeah, as I said already, people have uh, started to quantize gravity in this way. I should emphasize that for the full theory, the full Einstein theory, a quantum version does not exist yet. And generations of physicists uh, have been trying and are still trying to find something like that. There are several promising approaches, ideas, but none of them has led to a success until now. So if you want to, to know which approach is the most uh, promising, then it depends very much on whom you talk to. If you talk to a string theorist, the answer will be inevitably be that a string theory is a solution to everything. If you talk to somebody from a different community, he might point to loop quantum gravity or some other approaches. But none of these uh, things works. And this formalism, quantizing this year, uh, if this has anything to do with a true, correct quantum theory of gravity is an open question. Yeah? And many people are very skeptical about this. So, um, yeah, this idea of a graviton, which is a quantum associated with this field, uh, it's not clear uh, whether this is a physically meaningful concept. Yeah, because it is based on this linearized theory and not on the full theory. Okay, this was an aside. We, do, we are not planning to do anything uh, with, with quantum gravity here. We view this as a classical theory, and as a classical theory, it gives a good approximation for wave-like solutions to Einstein's field equation. But it's an approximative theory. It should always be kept in mind. And uh, yeah, just uh, let me just remind you, 
what we have here is a, is a Lorentz invariant theory. Yeah, we are free to make Lorentz transformations. All the equations are invariant under Lorentz transformations. And uh, yeah, it's a Lorentz invariant theory of gravity on flat space-time. And such a theory exists only within this linear approximation. Yeah, for the full gravity theory, it's not possible to, uh, to uh, put it in the form of a Lorentz invariant theory on flat space-time. That's what Einstein tried in the beginning, 1905, for a couple of years. He tried to de describe gravity by a field on flat space-time, on Minkowski space-time. But uh, then he came to the conclusion that this is not possible and to introduce this idea of a, of a curved space-time. So in this linearized formalism, in this approximative formalism, such a theory does exist. And that's uh, how it looks like. Okay, so this was uh, this part. So now we have the equations. Now, of course, we want to solve them. And we begin with uh, the source-free case. So the case that on the right-hand side, we have the zero here. So we are now, we, we go to a, 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 to a region in space-time where there are no sources. The sources are somewhere else. But we are now in a region where we have no sources, where we have the zero here on the right-hand side. And we want to solve this equation and we want to discuss it. And uh, that's what we do now. So this is 3.2. Well, this is a wave equation. It's a linear wave equation. How do we solve a linear wave equation? Of course, with the help of a Fourier expansion. So we consider plane harmonic waves. Plane harmonic wave solutions. Of the linearized. field equation without sources. Oh, it just comes to my mind that I forgot an important thing. We have now made a coordinate transformation in order to, uh, to kill this divergence. So we have solved this equation with our originally given uh, right-hand side here. Now this term is zero. And uh, from this equation you read that we are still free to make gauge transformations, to make, uh, yeah, in this context, gauge transformation means coordinate transformations. Yeah? Because of this analogy, one calls uh, a coordinate transformation in this formalism often a gauge transformation. So we are still free to make gauge transformations where we have the zero here. Yeah? Because then the zero is preserved. Yeah? So we have still not fixed the coordinates uniquely. We are still free to make coordinate transformations with the function f nu such that the wave operator applied to f nu is zero. These transformations are still possible. We will make use of this freedom in a minute. OK, so we want to solve now this equation. If you write it out in coordinates, just to remind you, these are 10 equations. Yeah? 10 equations for the 10 components of the gamma mu nu. Yeah, gamma mu nu is a 4 by 4 matrix, but it's symmetric. So I have the four elements on the diagonal and the six in the upper right hand corner. So it gives the, they give the, full, give the full scheme. And we have to keep in mind that we work in the Hilbert gauge. So if the Hilbert gauge condition is not satisfied, that's not the correct field equation. Yeah? So that's what we have. And well, we want to discuss plane harmonic wave solutions. So our ansatz is that of a plane harmonic wave. And in this case, it's a function gamma mu nu, which depends on x, of course, which uh, where the gamma has two indices. So one would write this in the following form. There's an amplitude. This is now something with two indices. If you do electrodynamics, you have something with one index here and here. And then we have the usual phase e to the i, k sigma, x sigma. So uh, where k, k0, k1, k2, k3 is real and constant. Yeah, that's a wave covector 
constant means independent of x. Yeah. So it's a constant for covector. <coughs> and a mu nu, the a mu nu are complex and constant. These are the amplitudes. So you have to allow the amplitudes to be complex because this gives phase factors, right? uh, phase, um, uh, phase shifts, right? And you have to allow for them because you cannot expect uh, different components to be in phase. Yeah? So if you write this uh, as, a, as a real, uh, as, a, um, as, a, as a modulus times e to the, to the i times phase, then the phase comes here with a plus sign. And for different indices, mu and nu, you will in general give dif uh, you get different phase shifts. Yeah? So you really need uh, the a mu nu's to be, to be complex in order to allow the different components to be out of phase, what they are in general. Actually, we will calculate how the phases are related. And well, this ansatz we now, uh, I think uh, everybody recognizes here the familiar expression, right? Okay, just to be sure, let me write it out x sigma x sigma uh, uh, k sigma x sigma is the following this is k naught x naught plus k1 x1 plus k2 x2 uh, here's a minus sign plus k3 x3 no sorry sorry the index is down the index is down there's no minus sign yeah if i if i if i pull the index then i would i would get a minus sign and x naught as usual is c times t and a good idea for this to be uh, to write for this minus omega over c. Yeah. It's k naught, the time component of the wave covector, covector with an index down. This is uh, this defines the frequency omega with the help of this equation, and then we can write this as k times x. And are these three terms minus omega t. Yeah. So it's a familiar phase. So this is again an example where you see uh, how convenient this uh, index formula is, right? So this is, this is definitely shorter than this here. Yeah. So this is a familiar phase factor. Okay, some place and have some, um, some space. Oops. So we will now plug this ansatz into the field equation and into the Hilbert gauge condition and see what it tells us about the wave covector and the amplitudes, yeah, about the direction, space-time direction in which our plane wave can propagate, and about the polarization states of the amplitudes. What I do now is completely analogous to what one is doing in electromagnetism. The only difference has come from the fact that now I have two indices, where in electromagnetism I have one index. And this will lead to one important difference, namely two different polarization states. So obviously here is nothing like a yeah, polarization director, direction of a of an electromagnetic, of an electric field vector or something like that. So the polarization must be characterized by something else. It must be characterized in some way by the amplitudes a mu nu instead of the, um, uh, yeah, instead of the vector uh, which we have in electro, uh, electromagnetism. Okay, so what do we get if we plug the, this ansatz into the 
field equation and into the Hilbert gauge condition. So we have zero is box gamma mu nu, and this was d nu, uh, partial nu, partial nu, and gamma mu nu was the real part of a mu sigma, uh, no, mu nu, ah, should not use the index nu here, and then I have mu nu e to the i k sigma x sigma. So this means the derivative with respect to x rho. And an x I have only here. Yeah, the k and the a mu nu are independent of x. So the only thing which is differentiated is this expression. So let me begin with this derivative. And I have a mu nu. The exponential function reproduces itself. And differentiating with respect to x rho gives a factor i k rho. i k rho e to the i k sigma x sigma. Okay. And then I apply the derivative again when I have a mu nu. i times i gives a minus sign. I'll write it here. k rho k rho e to the i k sigma x sigma. So k is real, so I can write this factor in front of everything. Minus real part a mu nu e to the i k sigma x sigma. Now our wave is, is of course supposed to be non-zero at least not identical, identically zero. Of course, for some particular values of x sigma, it may be zero. Yeah, a wave usually has zero somewhere. But it's certainly not identically zero. So the only way in which this whole expression can be identically zero is by the fact that this must be identically zero. So we must have k rho, k rho equal to zero. How would you interpret this expression? Or maybe I can, I should write it out if I denote the components of k in this way. Yeah? The spatial components are k1, k2, k3, and the temporal component is with the index down, is minus omega over c. So this would be um, uh, g0, 0, 0, ko, ko, plus uh, yeah, g i j k i k j is zero, and this was this is a minus one, and this is omega over c, and it comes twice, so it's omega squared over c squared. This is um, uh, sorry, sorry, eta, eta, oh, eta. Our convention is we pull indices with eta, yeah. So, eta, not g. Uh, but I did it correctly. <laughs> eta naught naught is minus 1. And uh, this is just a Kronecker. So this is just uh, in usual three vector notation this year, right? And uh, yeah, usually one solves for omega. Oops. And then we have omega is just plus or minus c times k. Well, we want to have positive frequencies, then it's the one with a plus sign. OK, that's the expression, which in this form uh, can be written out in three vector notation. So how would you interpret this? First of all, I hope everybody has seen this equation. It's very familiar from electrodynamics. Yeah? It's uh, in the, when one calls it the dispersion relation. Yeah? Omega as a function of k, quite generally for any kind of waves in solid state physics or whatever. This is usually called the dispersion relation. And we see that we have the same dispersion relation as for electromagnetic waves in vacuum. And uh, this is the same equation in four vector notation. And it tells us that the k rho is light-like. Yeah? The k rho is light-like with respect to the Minkowski metric. So the wave propagates at the speed of light 
in the background. Yeah? So the speed of light is measured with respect to the background metric, not in the time-dependent uh, metric G. And uh, yeah, this is, this is meant when people say gravity propagates at the same speed as, uh, as light or as electromagnetic waves. Yeah? It's true in this linearized theory. The question, what is the speed of gravity, is much more complicated in the full theory. Yeah? You can answer it in a certain way, then you have to discuss the characteristics of Einstein's equation. But here in the linearized theory, it's quite clear what is meant with this statement. It just refers to the background metric. I have a background metric. The background metric tells me what the speed of light is. And the statement is, what we have just calculated, is uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Gravitational waves in this formalism propagate at the speed of light in, in the background. Uh, but you also have uh, to, uh, to remember the, the gauge condition. So we also have this equation. So this is the real part of uh, u e to the i k sigma x sigma. So differentiating is a linear process, so I can pull the derivative under the real part. This is constant. This differentiated gives i k mu, i k mu, e to the i k sigma x sigma. And again, this is to hold identically. So this must hold for all x sigma. Now if you write this out, you get a combination of sine and cosine terms. Yeah? Remember, if you write, decompose this in real and uh, imaginary part, you get sine and cosine terms. They come multiplied with the real part and the imaginary part of the a mu nu. So you get a linear combination of sine and cosine functions. Sine and cosine functions are linearly independent. Yeah? You cannot, uh, if you have a sine function and a cosine function, and you have two factors in front of them, the whole thing can be zero only if both factors are zero. Yeah? You, cannot, you, cannot, uh, um, uh, you cannot make a, a sine function um, uh, with the same phase, yeah? with the same phase uh, uh, linearly uh, dependent of, of, of a cosine function. So the only way in which this zero can hold is that's a factor. The factor must be zero. The real part and the imaginary part of this factor must be zero. So this can hold only if a mu nu k mu is zero. Yeah? So these are the two equations which we get from the field equation and from the gauge condition. So whenever our amplitude a mu nu and our wave covector, or now I have pulled the thing, now it's a wave vector, when these two things uh, in this ansatz here, in this ansatz, when they uh, satisfy the field equation and the Hilbert gauge condition, it's necessary and sufficient that these two equations hold. Yeah, so whenever these two equations are satisfied, then um, the field equation and the Hilbert gauge condition is satisfied. So a general solution to our problem a general solution to this homogeneous equation with a zero there and the corresponding gauge condition is a superposition of plane harmonic waves where each plane harmonic wave satisfies these two conditions. Yeah? You can, of course, consider arbitrary superpositions of them. We have a linear theory, so if you have two solutions, then the superposition of them is also a solution. And uh, yeah, with the help of this uh, superposition principle, you can form Actually, yeah, more or less all solutions which are physically reasonable. I think you remember that everything can be written as a, uh, as a Fourier, uh, uh, can, be, can be decomposed into, into plane harmonic waves by Fourier analysis if it satisfies some very mild uh, conditions. Uh, yeah, square integrability or something like that is necessary. Yeah? Then, then it works. So uh, we have the full set of solutions to our problem uh, yeah, in our hands, yeah? quite explicitly. Just superpositions of these uh, plane harmonic waves. And now we want to interpret them a little bit. We want to discuss how they actually look like. And this is uh, yeah, not so easy directly to be read from the equations as we have them now. 
So what one usually does is one makes use of this additional gauge freedom. Yeah? I emphasize it, that we can still make coordinate transformations where the wave operator applied to F nu is zero. And we make use of this to consider within the Hilbert gauge um, uh, solution, the solution with Hilbert gauge condition, a subclass which is more, uh, restricted more, which is then called the TT gauge, um, uh, gauge solutions, where we can uh, interpret the, the solutions more conveniently. So we use, use the additional gauge freedom gauge freedom to restrict the solutions further. And I think I, yeah, I formulate this as a claim and then I prove it. So the claim is that I can uh, make such a coordinate transformation uh, to the effect that two additional conditions are satisfied. One is a transverse, transversality condition and the other one is a traceless condition. Both begins with a T, that's why it's called the TT gauge. And uh, so let me write this claim and then let me prove it. Uh, whenever I come to this part, I have done this several times in, in lecture courses, whenever I come to this part I'm not really happy because the proof is, is kind of yeah, clumsy, awkward. Uh, it's not difficult actually. It's, uh, every single step is quite quite simple and straightforward, but the proof altogether is, is a bit is a bit awkward. But I couldn't come up with a more elegant proof until now, so I will do it again in the way I've done it before. So assume we have a plane harmonic wave. the field equation with the Hilbert gauge condition. My claim is, if I fix uh, on my background an observer field, yeah, an inertial system, an inertial system is fixed by a particular four vector, a four velocity vector of a, uh, of a, of a family of observer. So fix uh, four vector u mu with the usual normalization condition. Yeah? This means that it is the four velocity of uh, yeah, some, somebody who uses on his, on his integral curves uh, proper time for the parametrization. That's this condition. So it's what we usually require of a four velocity. So it's a constant four vector, no x dependence. This means we have an inertial system. Yeah? A four velocity chosen at each point. At each point, the same four velocity vectors as gives an inertial system. Then there is a coordinate transformation x mu goes over in x mu, uh, nonsense, in um, a mu, I don't need this actually, x mu plus f mu of x, such that with box f mu equals zero, so it preserves the Hilbert gauge condition, such that two conditions hold. So my, uh, maybe I should have, when I say I have a plain harmonic wave solution, I mean I have something like that. Yeah? I have such an expression. So I have an a mu nu and a k mu. And the a mu nu is supposed to hold, to satisfy two conditions. This is zero. So this is what one calls a, a transversality condition. And the second condition is eta mu nu, a mu nu is zero, and this is what one calls a traceless condition. 
Well, I think the second term, the second uh, name is obvious, right? I just consider the trace of the mu nu with respect to the eta and require it to be zero, so that's the traceless condition, obviously. Why is this called the transversality condition? Well, we have this here already. Yeah. So the propagation four vector, the covector, which is associated with our wave, satisfies this condition. If now I have also this condition, then it means that the a mu nu has components only perpendicular to the two-dimensional plane stand, spent by our observer field and the propagation direction. Yeah, the observer field is time-like, the propagation direction is light-like. The two things span a two-dimensional Minkowski space. This is a space in which the wave propagates. Yeah? The history of the space, uh, spatial direction in which the wave propagates. And because this is zero, the A mu nu has components only perpendicular to this. Yeah? So it's transverse to the direction in which the wave propagates. It's a transversality condition. Okay, and that's what we want to prove. And this will take some time. Uh, let me see. Yeah, but I will make it today. This, <laughs> I hope it will not take more than 25 minutes. Okay, we want to perform such a coordinate transformation. And, well, we have a plane harmonic wave. And if we want to get nice relations, then it's fairly obvious that we also make an ansatz for this f mu, that it also has a wave-like behavior. Choose uh, f mu of x in the following form. It's also a plane. Uh, um, maybe I should write again the, the sorry, the, the gamma for the solution. What was the gamma? Just to remind ourselves and to have it on the board, because I will erase this in a second. Uh, a mu nu e to the i k sigma x sigma. Okay. This was, and I choose now our f mu, the coordinate transformation. This is a function of x. This is also a function of x. I choose this also as a real part of such an expression with the same phase factor here. So this is a real part of some amplitude times the same phase factor. Here's a wave vector of my, of my solution. And I think I write i, I call the amplitude for some reason i times c mu. I found this convenient to introduce this factor i. I can call the amplitude as I like. Yeah? So I call it i times c mu. And then let's see what we get. So now we calculate the transformation. Oops. Uh, yeah, of course, I have uh, erased the transformation behavior of the gamma mu nu. Uh, I will need this in a second again. We calculated about half an hour ago how the gamma mu nu transforms. If we make a, a coordinate transformation, I will need this again now. Oops. Uh, by the way, I should emphasize this idea of the transverse traceless gauge. This, of course, only works uh, in the source-free uh, case, right? The Hilbert gauge uh, could be chosen uh, whenever we are in the linearized theory. The energy momentum tensor could be whatever it uh, likes to be. But the transverse traceless gauge is something which is defined only if the energy momentum tensor is zero, because only then do we have this kind of... Um, uh, of plane harmonic wave solutions, right? With an energy momentum tensor in general, solutions of this kind will not exist. So transverse traceless is something which uh, refers to vacuum solutions, to source-free solutions.
Okay. Okay, now I have to look up the transformation behavior of the gammas. We have calculated it half an hour ago. Here it is. So we had gamma mu nu was transformed into gamma mu nu minus d mu f nu minus d mu f nu plus eta mu nu. The divergence of f. So in our case, where both things are given by these wave-like expressions, so we have here e to the i k sigma x sigma is transformed into what? So let me see if I can do this in, um, in one step. So here I have the a mu nu. If I differentiate my f nu with respect to mu, I get i times uh, the derivative of the c. So I get, uh, here's a minus sign, minus i times the derivative of c. And the index is pulled down with the eta. The same thing with the indices interchanged. And here I have plus eta mu nu. And uh, here um, i times d rho c rho, OK? I think that's it. So from this expression, you can see how the a mu transforms. So the a mu transforms in the following way. It transforms, ah, ah, come on, what have I done here? <laughs> complete nonsense. Yeah, the c is constant. The c is, ah, this is completely wrong. Uh, so when I differentiate, the k comes down, right? When I differentiate this with respect to x, then I get i times k. Yeah? And the C is constant. This is just, uh, uh, this is just uh, unaffected. So I have a minus sign here. Then I have minus I C nu. And I differentiate my exponential function, which gives the factor I K mu. I K mu. That's it. Now the same thing with uh, mu and nu interchanged. And here I have plus eta mu nu, c rho. I need more space. Oops. C rho. And differentiation, uh, differentiation with respect to x rho gives the factor i k rho. Oops. And uh, uh, there was an i times c rho. Yeah, because I put this, this factor i here. So I hope now it's correct. Now we can see what happens to the a mu nu. Of course, this is a constant thing. It doesn't depend on x, right? So there's, there's no x dependence allowed. So this goes into a mu nu. i times i gives minus 1. With this minus, it gives a plus. c nu. Came. Now you see why I introduced this factor i in this expression because I don't want it, I didn't want to have an i here. Yeah, that's the reason why I've written the i here. This is also plus c mu k nu. And here i times i gives a minus sign. Eta mu nu k rho c rho. So this is the transformation behavior of the a mu. And the question is, can we choose the c rho in such a way that these two conditions are satisfied. So by the way, let me give names to them. So let me call this T1 and this T2, because then now I will uh, evaluate the conditions uh, separately. Uh, yes. 
So T1 and T2, we have to write these two conditions now down. So T1 requires that if I transact this with u mu, that then I get a zero, right? This is the first condition there. So after the transformation, the new a mu nu should give a zero if it is translated with u nu. So this is u mu a mu nu plus c nu k mu plus c mu k nu minus eta mu nu k rho zero is zero. And t2. Requires what? It requires that the trace of this thing is zero. E times mu nu plus c mu k mu. This is symmetric, right? So I can combine these two terms. Yeah. If I interchange the indices here, there's no no difference. So the the, the order of the indices here doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, okay. Let me write it in the way as it is here. K rho, C rho. Uh, there's something wrong with the indices. Wait a minute. It, uh, no, I think it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. K rho, C rho. Yes. I think I can satisfy, uh, simplify this a little bit. So this is eta mu nu, a mu nu. Plus two, so one index is, is pulled up. So this is k mu c mu. And eta times eta gives a four. So two minus four gives a minus two. So I think that's it. So these are the two equations which we will try to, uh, to satisfy. Yeah. We. Um, we are always free to make Lorentz transformations because Lorentz transformations uh, leave the eta invariant. And uh, yeah, with the perturbations, uh, the perturbation, of course, um, doesn't become bigger if we make a Lorentz transformation. So linearization with the old perturbation is, uh, is not affected by such a transformation. So we can use, uh, so, we perform a Lorentz transformation. Lorentz transformation such that our chosen u mu, yeah, which is a four velocity vector, that this takes a standard form C0, 0, 0, 0. Yeah? So we can always choose our axis in this way. And then we have our equation T1. And you see, this is actually four conditions. Yeah, the index nu takes four values. So nu is 0, 1, 2, 3. And I will first consider the case that nu is a spatial index. Yeah, so it's 1, 2, or 3. Then let's see what we get. So the u mu has only a component for mu equals 0. And then it is c. Yeah? So this is c times a zero j. Yeah, mu must be zero, otherwise I get I don't get anything. Then I have C j k zero. Then the other way around. C zero k j. And here I have uh, mu is zero, then u must also be zero. But uh, mu is supposed to be j, so I'm already done, right? So oh, that's it. Yeah. If if uh, nu is no, is not equal to zero, and that's what we assume, we assume it is equal to j. Then mu must also be one, two, or three. But then the transaction with u will give zero. So that's what we have, and we see that you can solve this equation for cj. Cj is then uh, this is of course not zero. 
Yeah, because it's a, it's a light-like vector, and if the k naught would be zero, then the whole vector would be zero. So we, we want really, we really want to have a wave which is propagating somewhere, and of course I can divide by c. So uh, cj is minus one over k zero times a o j plus c o k j. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we can choose a C0 such that all the equations are satisfied, or the other equations are satisfied, then this equation, these three equations, can be satisfied in this way. Yeah? So the only thing which we have to uh, discuss now is uh, whether or not the C0 is restricted, and by what it is restricted. If we have found out this restriction, then with this restricted C0, we can determine the Cj by this equation. And for that we need the other equation for u equals zero. For u equals zero, we have uh, again c times something. Then I have here a naught naught. And I have here c naught k naught, and I get this two times. And here I have, uh, let me see, uh, this is zero. Then eta zero zero is minus one. So together with a minus sign, which is already there, I get a plus. And then I have k rho k rho, k rho c rho. Sorry. So this must be zero. Oops. Okay. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So this is, of course, irrelevant. So I have a zero zero plus two k zero c zero. And what is this here? We raise and lower indices with the eta. So this is plus eta rho sigma k rho c sigma is zero, right? If I write this out, the last term, I get minus k0 c0, yeah, because eta 0, 0 is minus 1. And then I get plus delta ij kj c, uh, ci is 0. So this goes away. And we know that we have to satisfy this equation in order to uh, have uh, the, trans uh, the transversality condition for u equal j. So we can insert this expression for cj, and then we are left with a condition for c0. So we have this here, plus delta ij kj, and c, uh, okay, let me write it this way, then I can copy the cj directly from here. This is minus 1 over k0 aoj plus co kj. Oops. Equal to 0. OK. Do I multiply this with k0? Let me see. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, I just write it out. I ah, that's a trick. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, J. Yeah, uh, do I have this on the board still? Yes, yes. This is, a, this is a crucial equation. We have this here. Yeah, we have a solution to our field equation which requires our wave covector to satisfy this condition. So 
we can, here we have such an expression, we can rewrite this as a, as a summation over all four indices if we subtract the, zero, uh, uh, the zeroth order term. So let me first copy the first term, don't do anything with this, ki1 over k0 aoj. And for this here I write the following, this is minus eta mu nu k mu 1 over k naught c naught k nu or let me write the k nu uh, here in this place uh, 1 over k naught c naught. Now I made a mistake. Here the summation goes only over the spatial components. I have carried out the summation now over all four indices. Of course I have to subtract the term which I have added. This is the term where the index takes the value 0. So I write plus eta 0, 0, k0 squared, 1 over k0, c0 is 0. Now everything is fine again, right? These two terms together are the second term here. Yeah? And now you see why I have done this, because this here is 0. This is our dispersion relation. This is 0, and uh, yeah, this uh, has a nice property that the k0 cancels out. So let me see what we get. Uh, hmm. So I get A00 plus KOCO minus 1 over KO delta IJ KI AOJ. Eta naught naught is minus 1, minus k naught c naught is 0. Is this true? Does it really go out? No, it shouldn't go out. <laughs> uh, oh yes, it's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should go out. <laughs> it should go out. So what do we get now? Let me see. K O, A O O, minus delta ij times this is zero. And this is very nice because here I can pull an index up. Then I have eta naught naught with a minus sign. k naught, r naught naught. And instead of delta, I am allowed to write eta. Yeah? Because for Latin indices, delta is the same as eta. k i a o j is zero. And this is just minus eta mu nu k mu a naught mu is zero. That's the condition. And now look here. This is our Hilbert gauge condition, which is satisfied by assumption. So this is satisfied by assumption. So if we want to satisfy only the traceless condition, as a transversality condition, then all we have to do is, we can choose any C0 we like, no restriction whatsoever onto the C0, and we define the Cj by this equation, and then we are done. Yeah? Because uh, for the index nu equals 0, the equation is satisfied anyway, and for C equal j, and for nu equal j, we can satisfy it by choosing the Cj in this form. So if you only want to have the transversality condition, C0 is completely free, and Cj is determined by this equation. But we also want to have the traceless condition, and this will fix our C0. And I hope I, oops, five minutes. Let me try to do this, finish this today. I really don't want to begin with this, uh, with this awkward calculation again next time. I would really like to finish this today. So this is only one condition. Yeah, the transversality condition has four components. The traceless condition is only one scalar equation. So it doesn't take so much time. Oops. I hope I have 
haven't erased it. Of course I have. Uh, <laughs> I had the, uh, the traceless condition uh, on the board just until 30 seconds ago, and <laughs> then I erased it. Now I will need it. T2 requires what? This was eta mu nu a mu nu plus 2 k o c o. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, I've already uh, written it out here. Uh, so it was, it, it was in this way. Um, eta mu nu and the, with a minus sign. Let me see. Eta mu nu k mu c nu equals zero. That's how it was written. But now let's uh, expand this in spatial and temporal parts. Eta mu nu a mu nu minus two. Eta naught naught is minus one, so I get plus two k o c o minus eta ij ki cj is zero. And now cj, do I have this on the board still? Yes, cj was supposed to satisfy this condition. So I get what? So this is plus eta ij ki 1 over k naught a o j plus c o k j is 0. OK. Oops. And uh, I think I do the same trick now. Yes, exactly. So, but, but first I, I just write it out. Uh, here I can write a mu a mu if I want to write it in a somewhat shorter way. Here I have this. I think I just multiply this out. Yes. Plus 1 over k naught eta ij ki oj. And here I should, let me see. Uh, Oh yes, yes, I do exactly the same trick again. Eta ij ki kj is eta mu nu k mu k nu. And then I subtract the thing where the index is zero. Uh, Co over ko. So here I have replaced the Latin indices by Greek indices. So I have to subtract the whole thing with the index zero. K naught, k naught. C naught, K naught is zero. This again is zero. This was our wave equation, the dispersion relation. And here one K O cancels. And then we have A mu mu plus two K C O plus one over K O eta I J K I A O J. Minus eta naught naught gives plus one, plus one k naught c naught gives a three. That's funny. Do I have a three here? I have a four here. Did I forget a factor two? Some ah here I forgot a factor two, right? Here I forgot a factor two. Then I have here a two. I have here a two. Here a two, it doesn't matter because it's zero anyway. And here a two. So I have here a two and here a two. And then I just get, so this is a K zero. 
and oops. This here is minus eta naught naught k naught a naught j because uh, of the of the transversality condition, right? So the amplitude a mu is perpendicular to the k. So let's collect everything together. Two plus two is four. K O C O. And here I have minus eta naught naught is a plus one, plus two, the K O cancels. Oops. Uh, ah, a O O, of course. No, what is this? Yeah, yeah, A O O. That's correct. A O O. Yes, that's zero. Fine, very good. So what was the, the goal of the whole thing? The whole goal was to determine C naught. And that's what we have achieved, right? So C naught must be minus 1 over 4 KO A mu mu plus 2 A naught naught. So, and then I have everything satisfied. So if I choose my C naught in this way, and I choose my CJ, with a C naught inserted here in this way, then I have satisfied all four conditions, and that's what I want. Uh, all uh, yeah, the all five conditions if I count components. Yeah, the four components of the transversality condition and the, uh, and the uh, traceless condition. So with this choice of the amplitudes, I have actually uh, achieved my goal of performing a coordinate transformation, so that in the new coordinates. Both conditions are satisfied, the traceless condition and the transversality condition. Okay, I'm just three minutes over time, sorry for that. So we will continue with this, um, so this, this completes the proof. And in these new coordinates where we have these additional conditions, we will then discuss these plane harmonic waves on, uh, on Wednesday. And uh, then after that we will relate the, the waves to the sources. So and then the, the long term or the middle term goal is uh, is Einstein's quadrupole formula. So that's where we where we are aiming at. Okay. So if uh, if everything works out in the way I hope that it will work out, we will meet again on Wednesday. Okay. See you then.